Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast. In this podcast, we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we do tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors too. Hello podcast listeners, this is Sam Barker from Hugh James and I'm joined with my colleague and the head of the abuse team at Hugh James, Alan Collins. Hi Sam, hi everyone. Today we're talking about redress schemes, Alan, I believe. and Yeah, so we're going to be talking, I think, about redress schemes, which is quite topical because ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Sexual Abuse, as part of its accountability and reparations investigation, is going to be looking at redress schemes. And I thought that would be a good subject for us to talk about. Particularly because of late there's been a lot of redress schemes uh, put into place, um, some that a lot of people would know about, some you know, that would be not as well known, um, like the child migrants one, for example. So, Alan, why don't you largely tell the listeners what redress schemes are and your experience with them? Well, redress schemes are often seen as vehicles to deliver justice to victims, survivors, and some of the litigation process. They naturally, as a consequence, have an attraction. There's a certain appeal about them, but I think we can have a discussion today about that, about the attraction, but also ask ourselves whether some of this attraction might actually be superficial and redress schemes may not actually deliver what victims and survivors want. Um, I use the word justice. Justice, of course, can mean different things to different people. In my experience, justice often captures the need to be compensated, the right to be recognised, and very often encompasses an apology. But but redress schemes themselves usually come along with no admission of liability. Indeed, right? indeed. I can't think of a redress scheme where there has been admission of liability. Um, redress schemes are often created by governments and institutions and s- sort of public bodies. And in my experience, they're often the ones at the receiving end of litigation or potential litigation, and a redress scheme is often created against that backdrop. So you find that there isn't an acknowledgement of liability or recognition of liability or bid. There may be an apology in the sense that... We did wrong. We did wrong, we sorry, we let you down, that kind of thing, which for many people is very important, but for others they don't like the fact that there isn't actually... Hands up, we're legally responsible. Is there that, is a distinction for yeah. some people. Is that why you would say in some circumstances there's superficiality about it? Because it's created to avoid litigation that might result in them being liable? Yeah, and it's superficial in that sense because it's an escape away from that finding of liability or that admission of liability. And underpinning that is this further level of superficiality in which those who run the um, redress scheme or have set it up are sort of managing in a way. They they are managing their responsibilities. And I think that grates with some people. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it's in or out, isn't it? There's no kind of like room for movement on the on the edges of the of how it's set up. There isn't. You know, it's one size fits all in the sense that you apply and you have to abide by the scheme's terms. You have to follow the scheme's um, regulations and terms to the letter. There's little leeway. The alternative for some people, of course, is to go off and litigate. But quite often these redress schemes are created in circumstances where it is difficult to litigate. And so survivors and victims often have very limited options. Yeah, I think we'll talk about later on in this podcast the difficulties that we see arising in the Windrush compensation scheme, that redress scheme, which, you know, one size fits all in that kind of context, in my view, really doesn't work. But before we go on to that, perhaps you can um, outline where there are redress schemes that you know of here in, in the UK and abroad and indeed ones that you've worked on. Wow, if you sit down and think about it, there are a fair number of redress schemes up and running at the moment. We know there's the National Redress Scheme in Australia. 
And Australia has a long history of redress schemes. There are state schemes to pay out compensation or provide redress for survivors. Those have now been superseded by the national scheme. There's the Lambeth redress scheme, which I know you're working on, Sam. Yep, that's right. Um, I've been involved in the two redress schemes in Jersey, the historical abuse redress scheme and now the current Jersey redress scheme. And um, we've got experience of representing survivors in redress schemes that were created in very bespoke circumstances. So the range is wide. And of course, you've mentioned the Windrush scheme, which is up and running. And we are involved in that, which um, is an interesting one, because it's going to be interesting to see how that actually works out. It's designed to be sort of user friendly, so to speak. Mm. But our experiences to date is such that those um, applying seem to be struggling with it. And I'm wondering what the final outcome will be on that, whether people will get the redress that they think they're entitled to. I think there's a big question mark on that. And of course, we're often involved advising people about the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority scheme, because in a way, that's that is in a, itself that's, that's a scheme. A, that's yeah. a long-standing scheme that goes back decades, and we know that ICSA, the Independent Inquiry, has been looking at that, and I believe we'll be looking perhaps some more into it. And then there's um, at the other end of the spectrum. There's the Miscarriages of Justice scheme, which is for those who are innocent of crimes that they've been convicted of. Um, That's an interesting one because what we're interested in is people who've been trafficked, who are victims of trafficking, if they've been prosecuting convicted of of crimes that they should not have been criminalised for because they were victims of trafficking, Mm. they may be eligible for compensation under this miscarriages of justice scheme because, of course, at the end of the day, the law says they were innocent. So So, like people engaging in... People engaging in some sort of illegal conduct under duress, for example, or in the context of being trafficked, they might have been wrongfully convicted for something. Yeah, you can think of an example, perhaps a victim of trafficking brought to the UK to work as a so-called sex worker. Mm. Um, And crimes get committed through having to work as a sex worker. And arguably, they should not have been prosecuted, let alone convicted, Therefore, under the, the, the European Treaty, which, which governs all of this, which the UK has to abide by, they could be deemed innocent and therefore entitled to be compensated for, for example, being sent to prison when they shouldn't have been sent to prison because, at the end of the day, they're innocent. Yeah, they were forced into it. That, that kind of circumstance, I'm sure, presents itself all the time because when there's raids of illegal brothels, for example, the people that they're going to um, arrest there are the... The, you know, the, the prostitutes within these illegal brothels and probably not the people who have set them up or indeed are responsible for them. And that leaves, you know, a very unfair result. The people who have been trafficked into the country and are forced to work in these conditions are the people who end up you know, sent to prison. It seem to be grossly unfair. So this kind of redress scheme you would hope would provide those kind of people with uh, with some sort of redress. The devil was often in the detail with these schemes. So... Um, people who are affected or think they may have been affected or if you are working with someone who has been affected, you need, in my opinion, to look at the terms of the schemes very carefully and with all of them, I, I, I think you have to have legal advice because you have to study the terms very carefully and it can be quite testing. So you've got to make sure that if you're applying for redress under one of these schemes that you get it right because if you don't get it right, you're going to get chucked out of the scheme so you need to as i say um study the detail very carefully because the devil is in the detail i think there's a sort of naive innocent belief that oh here's a scheme you fill out a form and you get redress it doesn't work like that Mm. you know you've got in very many cases quite a few hoops to jump through hurdles to overcome because if you don't if you fail on one you get kicked out of the scheme yeah, uh, yeah. You need to get in the four corners of the scheme. And also, what about in this kind of circumstance, what would happen to a claim for false imprisonment, for example, if you're bringing a claim separately? Well, if you're looking at taking litigation, you know, suing in respect of false imprisonment, you've got to be mindful that there are time limits. Limitation Act 1980 sets down time limits. If you're making a claim for 
that arises out of your human rights, again, you've got very strict time limits to adhere to. A year. Yeah, exactly. So um, a year sounds like a long time, but actually, in a legal sense, it isn't. You know, no, we no, see no. hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands, who are outside these time limits. So that presents an additional challenge in itself for us. So people must never sit on the fence and they should get advice and then make an informed decision about what they should do. Indeed, and also advice can encompass the fact that if you have a viable civil claim that's arguably worth more than what you would receive under the redress scheme, then you could be locking yourself out for a higher degree of compensation. Indeed, that's what we've seen happen in Australia with the Australian redress scheme in that people will be locked into certain tariffs under the scheme, whereas if they sued the institution directly, they'll be entitled to far more damages than what they would receive under the scheme. So that kind of legal advice is really, it really essential is in that kind of case. And what is um, troubling, and we heard this in evidence at ICSA, those who are gateways for survivors and victims in providing signposting are often unaware of these legal remedies themselves. So they're often giving well-meaning but ineffectual, if not inaccurate, advice to victims and survivors. And therefore, unsurprisingly, you find victims, victims and survivors going about completely ignorant of what their legal rights are and not aware that they are entitled to compensation, which could be extremely important. Mm. Yesterday at ICSA, um, at a preliminary hearing, on accountability and reparation, a core participant, a survivor, made the very eloquent point that as a result of the abuse that he suffered as a youngster, he was deprived of his education. And for him, redress was access to education. And access to education means being able to go to college, university and study, but also to have the means to do it. So we see lots of cases where people are coming are coming forward to seek redress stroke compensation so that they've got the wherewithal to actually go to college go to university and pick up where they should have been had they not been abused so there's a real practical need for people to have the right advice so that they can access their legal remedies and if one of their legal remedies is having the means to go to college or university well, you know, I'm sure everyone would say, yeah, that should happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, some schemes like the Lambeth scheme, for example, they don't provide for, for any kind of uh, compensation for loss of opportunity for education and those things, which is a real grievance for a lot of my clients who are going through the Lambeth scheme because they feel like quite aside from the abuse that they suffered whilst they were in the care of Lambeth is the fact that there was never really real thought given to getting these kids into school and making sure they remained in school. And a lot of the, as I say, I'm also involved in the independent inquiry into child sex abuse and the upcoming hearings into Lambeth, which will also include looking into the Lambeth redress scheme. And this is a point that my clients who are core participants in that, in that, in those hearings want to make. And that is that they were essentially deprived of an education, that opportunity to go to school and nobody was ever, you know, cracking down and making sure they were going. Unfortunately, that doesn't come under this game. Yeah, and I would have thought many, many survivors up and down the land are going to say, yeah, we echo that because that's an important part of why we've come forward. It's, it's the loss of education, the loss of opportunity. We hear that time and time again, mm. which brings us back to the whys and wherefores of redress schemes because redress schemes, by and large, do not necessarily deliver in full, what a survivor or victim wants when they're seeking redress. I'm not knocking redress schemes. Redress schemes have a very important place in the uh, armoury, so to speak, when it comes to delivering justice. But they're not the be-all and end-all. They're not a panacea. Um, far from it. And they don't always necessarily deliver, I think, justice. But let's not knock them. But I think we need to appreciate their weaknesses as well as the strengths. Well, speaking about that, I guess going back to the what we, you know, noted we might speak about at the start, is the uh, Windrush redress scheme that's being set up. I think that in our experience looking at the scheme, there's we foresee that there might be a fair few problems with it, and one of those is 
the clients being able to provide evidence about their loss. So it seems to me very document heavy, having looked at it, when what you need to provide to evidence a, a loss of income as a result of being part of the Windrush generation. Indeed, and that's what applicants tell us. You know, they're being asked to provide documents, which, of course... They don't have. They don't have. They, no. You know, who keeps every single piece of paper that's come through the letterbox or across, you know, their threshold um, over 20, 30, 40 years in some cases? It's, it's just unrealistic. And, you know, many of these people were affected when they were children. Of course, when they were children, they would not necessarily have responsibility for the paperwork anyway. So it's, uh, it's a scheme... Um, on which I have personally have some reservations because yeah. I think it's it's not really designed in a simpler a way as it perhaps it ought to be, and my fear is is that some people are going to end up being very disappointed. Yeah, the crisis this crisis came about because people didn't have the right documentation to prove their ability to Indeed. remain in the UK. Yeah, and it's an interesting solution to turn around and say that same group of people have to provide extensive documentation to evidence their loss. That's going to be. I think you know, I've got clients who are trying to go through that redress scheme, they're just simply not going to be able to get that documentation. No, they're being set up to fail, potentially. Um, and that's why I think I'm saying it's going to be interesting to see how all this works out, because, as I said, personally, I have reservations that it's actually going to deliver, certainly for people that we're trying to help. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, look, um, great speaking about redress schemes, Alan. We decided that in this format of the podcast, we would also touch on Places we've <laughs> eaten or been to in the last, uh, you know, since the last podcast. And one of those places is the March Hare in Guildford we went to on the weekend. What's your view of the March Hare in Guildford? That was good, wasn't it? You know, yeah, I think we, um, we all had a, um, a good feel there, so to speak. I think I had beef. I had beef. Yeah, that was good. From Cornwall. That, that, yeah, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah. The weather was awful. It was raining. It was damp and all the rest of it. But inside, it was the atmosphere was great. Um, happy atmosphere. Good service, I think, if I remember rightly. Yep. I think you had pheasant. No. You had uh, pork. Marina had pheasant. That's right. You had <laughs> pork, didn't you? Yeah, that looked rather good, actually. It was an excellent mm. place and also mm. got a view of the castle, mm. which I thought was great. So I wrote in an entry to the good pub guard to try to get that in there because I thought it was excellent. Oh, you're after a free meal. Yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Send it in. All anyway, right. thank you very much. Thanks sure. for listening. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. If you would like to speak to Alan or I about something you have heard this week, or even if you would like to suggest a topic for a future episode, please do get in touch at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk. 